here we are once again. Another year has gone by, hasn't it? And 2015 is now behind us, and now we're at the start of 2016. And uh, as we were just saying, it's sort of uh, become a little bit of a tradition, I guess. I don't know how many times uh, we've done this, but it, I think it's at least five and maybe six times where... You know, we've I've come along and we've gone back through some of the weekly World Watch uh, information that have been putting together throughout the past year, trying to put it all together so that we can sort of have a bit of an overview as to what's been happening on planet Earth from well, from God's point of view. See, the whole thing about prophecy, of course, isn't to try and be clever and isn't trying to say, look what's going to happen next. It's purely, I believe, God has given us this information so that we know where we are <coughs> on track to his goal, which is establishing on this earth the kingdom of God here on earth. And we know that all the things that are happening that we're going to look at tonight, as dreadful as many of them are going to seem, we should not fear. We've just sung that, haven't we, in that hymn. We should not fear because what's going to happen, of course, is that just when everything seems so bad, the Lord God is going to say to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you now to return to the earth and establish my kingdom on, on earth. And that is our hope. And that is why, you know, we're excited when we look at these things that we're going to look at. The world, I'm sure, looks at what we're going to look at and is horrified. And yes, we are also horrified at what we see. But it's, 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 it's not the be-all and end-all, is it? It's what is coming soon that we are longing for. And that's the excitement, really. Because so many things are coming together now, aren't they? You know, many, many things that for hundreds of years people have been talking about, and one might even say thousands of years people have been talking about, are happening in front of our very eyes. So what I thought we'd do is, uh, first of all, I thought I'd go and have a little look to see how uh, a news organisation might summarise 2015. And quite often when I've done that before, I've not actually played those types of videos because it wasn't sort of related to the themes that we want to look at. However, for the first time, pretty much ever, when I've gone onto the news organisations' websites, those who've collated a sort of a, a montage of videos and put them together and says, here's 2015, it's like watching a prophecy video. It really and truly, I mean, of course, it isn't from their point of view. They're just picking out the things that they say that are happening. But what I'm going to do now is play you, I've slightly uh, squished it down, so it's two minutes instead of about five. But literally, uh, what you're going to see is what ABC News over in America have put together themselves to summarise 2015. But before I just play you that... Just above the uh, video that summarised 2015 were these words. And this is, their, this is ABC News in America's summary of 2015. From start to finish, many of this year's biggest news stories were centred around violence, terror threats or a general sense of fear. The year began with a targeted terror strike in Paris and closed out with another planned attack in California proving that threats around the globe remain an issue for all. And there was a little bit more, but that was their opening line about 2015. And here is the video. Breaking news, masked men opened fire at the offices of a controversial newspaper in Paris. Two armed men entered the building and began opening fire. There's been a hostage taking at a culture deli. Meanwhile, those two brothers suspected of the attack are pulled up and cornered. Terrorists who traumatized this region for three days are dead, but not before leaving 17 innocent lives ended. Major new offensive launched by ISIS. The U.S.-led coalition is striking back. Are we winning right now? We're still building the forces. I'm confident we will win. The Russian passenger plane with 224 people on board crashes in Egypt. ISIS claimed it had brought down the plane. Vladimir Putin is vowing to take revenge. 
devastating earthquake in Nepal. This is the race against time. Brick by brick, the desperate dig to find survivors. A growing crisis overseas, migrants trying to escape their war-torn homelands attempting to get to Europe. President Obama is strongly defending that controversial deal to halt Iran's nuclear program. It is a good deal. You guys have been bamboozled, and the American people are going to pay for that. Bamboozled, outmaneuvered, outnegotiated. Were you fleeced? <laughs> There's a lot of politics going on now. Breaking news. This comes out of France where a German wings passenger plane has crashed. Disturbing new detail. The co-pilot intentionally crashed the plane into the mountains. The terror group ISIS claims responsibility for unprecedented attacks in Paris in six separate but coordinated bombings and shootings. The scene of the worst carnage at the Bataclan Theater. Witnesses say they saw these shooters arrive inside and begin firing indiscriminately. An international manhunt is now underway. Police carried out a deadly raid. The suspected ringleader is in fact dead. The soul of the city is intact. They have heavy hearts, but they are not going to succumb to fear. It seems another week, another tragic mass shooting. Nine people killed in an unthinkable crime in Charleston, South Carolina. What does it say about us that in 2015 somebody walks into a church and then shoots them one by one? The White House awash in a full rainbow in celebration of the Supreme Court's historic ruling on same-sex marriage. We've made our union no more perfect. Pretty amazing, isn't it, when you see it all put together like that. And Obama's final phrase, we've made our union just a little bit more perfect with the introduction of homosexual marriage. And that's a summary of... Uh, now, they haven't put all of this together to try and, you know, make some uh, point about God or prophecy, have they? But isn't that quite an astounding little uh, uh, number of clips there that sort of shows the shocking state of the earth in which we live. And I'm sure some of you will have thought, like I did, uh, about Matthew 24. It might be just worth having a very quick look at Matthew 24. There, of course, extremely uh, famous words to us all. Uh, but there in Matthew chapter 24, a couple of little, little bits just to uh, set the scene, if you like. Uh, so Matthew 24, verse 37... In your version, it might say uh, Noah as in N-O-E, but of course we know that this is talking about the Noah of the Old Testament. So in uh, Matthew 24, verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So when we see the earth very much like it was in the days of Noah, we know that Jesus is about to uh, return. And of course, going back to Genesis chapter 6, what we read there, if we were to turn to it, is that God said the, the earth at the time of Noah was full of what? Violence. Full of violence yeah. and full of one other thing. And he says it two or three times, the other thing. Wickedness. Not wickedness. Fear. Not fear. Corruption. corruption. Says it two or three times. And, and we think of corruption <coughs> nowadays as... You know, to do with money, don't we? But in God's sight, yes, financial corruption is, is a type of corruption. But of course, corruption in God's sight, most importantly, is corruption of his message, his word. And that is exactly what was happening at the time of Noah as well. So the earth was fully corrupt. So immorality is corruption in God's sight because it is not living as God has asked us to live. And that, therefore, is uh, corruption and violence and what we see on that video surely is violence to the extreme and immorality and corruption that's the world in which we live and in fact of course um, when we look back uh, at, uh, at verse sort of 30 we see there about the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven and all the tribes of the earth mourning. And if we went across to Luke chapter 21, of course, which is a parallel sort of chapter on the Olivet Prophecy, it says that men's hearts will be failing them for fear for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And did you hear 
the talk of fear on, 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 on that, and of course on their news summary as well. We live in the time of fear. And of course, terror, the word terror literally means, if you look it up, it means an intense form of fear. And terrorism is using intense fear to change the world. We live in the time of terror. So for me, this is, this is the world in which we live in. It is as it was in the days of Noah. And Jesus, the coming of the Son of Man, surely uh, is at hand. So what are we going to look at this evening? Well, there's a huge amount of things that we could look at. And probably each strand is, a, is an hour's talk at least on its own. So some of this we're going, to, we're going to keep pushing forward and maybe sort of canter through a bit quicker than I'd like. But I'd rather give you, you know, as much of an overview as I can. And then, you know, it's down to us individually to keep looking at all these things, isn't it? And to be alert and to be watchful and to be awake so that when Jesus does come, we're not caught sleeping. So what we're going to look at uh, this evening, we're going to look at uh, Russia, of course. There's the, uh, there's the bear there. Uh, we're going to look at Israel. There's their plane flying in here. There's a big oil spouting up there. There's oil's involved in all of this. This is an American plane flying in here. I think the picture's a little bit uh, dark on the screen there compared to my laptop, but I think you've got the general gist of uh, what's on the screen. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at Russia. Would you say Russia was a big news story in 2015? It was, wasn't it? What was the big thing that happened with Russia in 2015? What did they do? Syria. They entered the war in Syria. And, and it totally shocked the world and continues to shock the world. And we're going to look at that. The first thing, though, that I thought we'd have a, a look at is uh, the fact that Russia has been preparing for this. This isn't just uh, Putin waking up one day saying, do you know what, I'm going to go on a military excursion into the Middle East. This has long been uh, prepared. And I want you, if you would, just to come and have a look at uh, the famous chapter that I'm sure most of us know very, very well indeed, which is Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 is a prophecy about the last days. It's a prophecy about things that are going to happen at the very time of the end. So, um, just to, I'm sure, again, most of you understand uh, what's, what's happening uh, here, but effectively what we do have is in verse 2, uh, the description of some pretty strange sounding places, because they don't exist on planet Earth anymore from a name point of view. But in, uh, well, let's start at the beginning, Ezekiel 38, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, <coughs> Son of man, talking to Ezekiel, set thy face against uh, somebody called Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So this is a prophecy against an individual man. We know he's a man because it's a prophecy against him. And his name is Gog, and he lives in the territory of Magog, Meshach and Tubal. And we're not going to go into the. We did last last time I was here. We went through uh, where Magog was and where Meshach was and where Tubal uh, was. But suffice to say that those three territories encompass what we now know as modern Russia. So Magog is southern Russia, Meshach is central Russia, and Tubal is east uh, eastern Russia. It's the best description of the lot. That God, if God wanted to describe the nation of modern Russia, there are no three better names he could have picked to describe the huge landmass of Russia, which of course is the largest nation on the earth from a landmass point of view. Um, and, and of course, interestingly, Magog, ancient Magog, which was uh, the territory of the ancient Scythians, went all the way through uh, southern Russia and went halfway into what we now know as Ukraine, which is exactly why, well, it isn't why Putin's taking it. He's not thinking, I want the whole of Mago. He's saying, I want the Crimea, which is what he did last year, of course. But what he is doing by taking that eastern part of Ukraine is absolutely going to the very border of ancient Mago. 
Mago, by the way, in my view, and we can talk about this afterwards, has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Germany. Nothing at all. Mago is <laughs> southern Russia. It would sound a bit odd, wouldn't it, that Gog is of the land of Germany, but he's the chief prince of, of another area. He isn't. He is, the, he is the ruler and leader of Russia. <coughs> now, if you have a look in verse 7, well, now let's carry on having a look. In verse 4, it says, I will turn you back. We're not going to look at that phrase just now. But it says, I will put hooks in your jaws. So God's going to put hooks in the jaws of this Russian leader. And I will bring you forth and all your army. Horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armour. A great company. Now, of course, we're talking here. This is a, a latter-day uh, uh, prophecy. And, of course, we know it is a latter-day uh, prophecy because in verse 8 it tells us when all this thing happens and it happens when Israel if you notice has been gathered back into the land you see that it says in verse 8 after many days you'll be visited in the latter years in the last days that means you will come into the land that is brought back from the sword <coughs> that's gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel so this huge Russian force God says he's going to come down into Israel, and it's when Israel has been regathered. So when was that? 1948 was when Israel was re-established. 1967 was when they had taken the complete territory that was once theirs thousands of years ago. And God is saying, when that has happened... That's when this next thing's going to happen. So the Russian invasion could not have happened before 1967, but it must happen sometime afterwards, and therefore we're in that territory of time right now. But you notice in verse 7, it says, and this is really what I'm quoting on the screen here, verse 7 says, Be thou prepared, and prepare for yourself and all the company that are assembled unto thee and be thou a guard unto them. And there is a great company of nations that are with Russia when they come down. If you have a look in verse 5, it lists the nations. So number one on the list is Persia, which is modern day who? Modern day Iran. Ethiopia we know. Libya we know. Goma and Togomar are parts of uh, Turkey. There's a great big host of nations that join up with Russia. And God says in verse 7, get prepared. Well, what is he preparing? He's preparing his army. Now, what I'm going to do now is just play you some uh, slides here. So what I've done, I've gone back through the weekly World Watch um, headlines that I've pulled out each week this year, and I've just found the ones that seem to fit in with um, this particular theme here, preparing for war. So we're going to, I'm just going to read out the headlines, but I'm actually going to play a little bit of uh, music just so it gives it a... Uh, a little bit more interest than me just reading headline after headline. Is, is the camera working all right? Good. I might have to turn the music down because it might. I don't know what volume I've set it at. So, uh, so here's some headlines coming at you uh, just about this theme. Okay, <coughs> here we go. Yeah, we need to turn that down. So as a new year dawns, the world awaits Putin's next move. That was the 1st of January last year. Russia orders a snap test of nuclear missiles. That's January the 20th, 2015. Reuters, Russia starts large-scale military exercises in southern regions. That was in uh, Interfax. Associated Press, Russia opts out of European Arms Control Treaty. That was on March the 11th. Reuters, Russia starts nationwide show of force. That's on March the 16th. Russia threatens to use nuclear force over Crimea and the Baltic states. That was on April the 1st. Russia's state news agency, Let the World Fear Us. That was on April the 30th. Vladimir Putin's military firepower, how it compares to the West. And then we should have a table here, which we haven't got time to look at, but they've got two and a half million reservists and 766,000 troops ready to go. Uh, Putin accused of nuclear saber-rattling as he promises 40 new Russian missiles 
that was on June the 1st. Putin orders the creation of a new reservist force, that's July the 18th. Russia and NATO actively preparing for war, August the 12th. 95,000 Russian troops in massive military drill. That was on September the 14th. Now these aren't headlines from, you know, a sort of conspiracy website. They're from the likes of the Daily Telegraph, the BBC, and Reuters. They're the main news organisations that, that I'm looking at. So this isn't looking at some bizarre, you know, Elvis is alive type of website. This is everyday legitimate headlines and they're one after the other after the other. God says you're going to prepare. Did those headlines sound like Putin was building up for action? Certainly did, <laughs> did, did in my uh, eyes. And so it didn't really come as any surprise whatsoever uh, if we were looking at this to see that actually Russia uh, made this move into Syria. Now, have we been saying all along that Russia's going to move into Syria? Well, actually, I don't think we have. But I think what we have done is said that Russia's got to get down into Israel, and on the way through, most definitely, it's got to come uh, all the way through uh, the Caucasus region, it's got to come through Armenia, it's got to come through um, uh, 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 Syria to get down into Israel. There's no other way of doing it. So it's interesting that it's made this first step, isn't it, into this, um, in, into this particular part of the world. It's certainly heading in the right direction. And of course, Syria is hugely, hugely significant. And I think it is one nation, I was talking to Richard about this just before we started, Syria, I think, is a particular nation that we never really focused on in years gone by. But now these things are happening, we can see very clearly <coughs> that there is prophecy being fulfilled in relation to Syria. So the clearest one of the lot is in Isaiah 17. Let's just have a very quick look at that. Um, and this is underway, but is nowhere near complete yet. But it could be complete almost at any time. So if you find uh, Isaiah chapter 17, I'm standing, I'm standing on here. Have I, have I put on weight? Because I feel very squeaky on here. I've, I've probably put on weight. Oh, has it? Oh, all right. I've put on weight then. So, uh, so this is Isaiah chapter 17. Capital of Syria is Damascus always has been. Do you know the claim of Damascus? It's the oldest city, the oldest inhabited city in the world. Now I'm not saying that is exactly true, but that is precisely what it says. If you go onto Wikipedia, look at uh, Damascus, that's what it says. That's its claim to fame. God says Damascus is going to cease to be a city. Have a look at uh, Isaiah 17 verse 1. <coughs> the burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. Do you know something? It never has been taken away from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. Now, it isn't far off being a ruinous heap, I've got to tell you, but it hasn't yet been obliterated off the map, and it will. God doesn't lie. This isn't a symbolic chapter. This is absolutely for real, and Damascus is going to cease to be a city. And more than that, if you have a look at uh, verse 3, it says the fortress also will cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus. So in other words, when Damascus fails, the kingdom is going to cease from Damascus. And what that means is, is that the nation of Syria is going to come to a complete end. It's going to cease to function entirely as a nation state. And in fact, we're not far off from that. If you look at Jeremiah 49, you might want to make a note of that because it's the parallel chapter to Isaiah 17. And it basically says that all the men of war in Damascus will fall in one day. That is what is coming. And we can see how that could possibly happen, can't we now, with all the nations now, well not all of them, but many nations all bombing different people. But the, here's the key thing. Israel's going to get involved. How do I know Israel's going to get involved? Because it says here in verse 3 that Israel gets involved. It says, 
So in the context of Damascus failing, it says the fortress also will cease from Ephraim. And Ephraim is code for northern Israel. So northern Israel is going to have quite a difficult time itself because the fortress, its strength is going to uh, uh, sort of be affected. And in fact, in verse 4, it says, In that day it will come to pass that the glory of Jacob code for Israel, shall be made thin, and his fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. What does it mean for a nation like Israel to wax thin, or to be made thin, and to wax lean? It has to mean that Israel itself, as, as, as you know, its energy has been expended because of this conflict in Damascus. It is exhausted. It isn't feeling like that now, is it? But do you know something? It knows it's coming. And I'm going to show you some slides in a minute that show you that Israel knows what is coming. And they are actually quite, I wouldn't say fearful, but they are gearing up for what they think is going to happen. Now, let me just show you this. Because um, you can just about see him on the screen there. That is uh, the, the, the founder of the Christadelphians, as we know. That's Brother John Thomas. And all the way back in 1849, he wrote a book called Elpis Israel, which means the hope of Israel. And uh, he wrote these quite amazing words. When Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things, as at present constituted, is at hand. When you see Russia starting to make its move, you know, you better sit up and take notes, says, said John Tom. How did he know that? In 1849, was Russia a superpower with nuclear weapons and a, a, an army of millions? No. But he looked at this and he worked out, Ezekiel 38 was talking about Russia. I mean, he didn't have the internet then. I mean, I don't honestly know how people back then really worked things out as they did. I'll tell you what they did. They put a lot more time into studying the Bible than I think we probably do. But I was searching in Elpis Israel, this, uh, this ancient book now, 150 years at least old, and I looked to see what he said about Syria. And interestingly, he didn't really say much about Syria. In the whole book, it's only mentioned about seven or eight times. But he did say this. Let the autocrat, and by the way, when he says the autocrat, he's talking about the Russian leader. Uh, let the autocrat, however, be aware, uh, be aware how he lay his hand upon Syria. He basically said, you better be careful if you go and touch Syria. He doesn't expand on it, unless somebody can tell me afterwards that he does somewhere else. But he doesn't really say much more, but he says, just be very careful when you autocrat of Russia, when you Russian leader, when you go. If you go and search Syria, you better beware. And I found that quite interesting. He even had the foresight to, you know, to say that. But let me show you some headlines then about uh, the Russian invasion of Syria, and we'll, we'll go through the same thing uh, again. So here's some headlines, play a bit of music, this is what happened. So Russia wants to redesign the Middle East. That was April the 21st. Russian Navy has permanent Mediterranean sea force of 10 warships, that's July the 23rd. Russia is building military base in Syria, September the 5th. Russian military build-up in Syria, unprecedented, officials say, September the 10th. Russia creating forward air operating base in Syria, September the 14th. Russia begins military operations in Syria as Putin sends 28 jets. That was September the 21st. Syria conflict. Russia's intervention lifts crisis to new level. October the 1st. Russian missiles hit IS in Syria from the Caspian Sea. That was on October the 7th. Uh, Metro jet disaster could drag Russia further into Syrian quagmire, November the 5th. Russian bombers fly around Europe to strike Syria in an 8,000 mile show of strength, 
That was November the 20th. Turkey shoots down Russian warplane on the Syrian border, November the 24th. Russia deploys S-400 missile battery in Syria, state media says. That's November the 26th. Russia, no war with Turkey, however, over planned provocation. That was November the 26th. Russia sends its most advanced tanks into Syrian front line. That was December the 4th. Uh, war on ISIS. Vladimir Putin raises specter of nuclear weapons as Russia targets uh, ISIS in Syria. That was December the 9th. So you can see how that really has shook the world. Russia going in in this way is, is alarming for many, many reasons. And, and perhaps the most alarming of, of, of all is, of course, Russia is backing Assad. And America, who is also busy bombing, or was until just a few weeks ago, is busy backing the rebels. So now we've got two superpowers, believe it or not, both fighting different sides of a war. Now, the common enemy is ISIS. But actually, behind ISIS is the bigger story of what's going to happen to Syria and who's going to run the country. Now, interestingly, Russia has just stopped uh, bombing in Syria, well, using manned aircraft at least, and that is simply because those missile batteries that uh, Russia sent in after it lost its plane because Turkey shot it out of the sky are Russia's most advanced air def uh, missile defence system. It flew in plane after plane of these missiles. Now, these are seriously, seriously high-tech missiles to the extent that really America's got no defense to, um, to, come back at, uh, to come back at these missiles. These are missiles that will take down other missiles that are flying at thousands of miles an hour. And the whole of Syria now is covered with a blanket of missile coverage by Russia. So America has decided, actually, we've got no, we, we got no way of uh, coping now with, with these things, so we're stopping our flights. That was the impact of what happened with Turkey. You notice that uh, Russia has said we won't go to war with Turkey. Russia, I don't believe, will go to war with Turkey, and I don't see anywhere in the Bible it says that Russia will go to war with Turkey. Turkey, bearing in mind, is a NATO country. If, if Russia was to attack Turkey, instantaneously it's got a war with the whole of Europe and nowhere in the Bible does it say there'll be a great war between Russia and Europe not on that sort of scale we'll talk more about that uh, in, in, in just a minute but uh, Turkey is Togomar in Ezekiel 38 so even though the you know Russia says we've been stabbed in the back by a friend which is exactly the, the, the case when it comes to it in however long we've got to go Turkey will be on side with Russia when it comes down into Israel. It most categorically will. Now, what's going on? Well, I found another news clip here, which you might be interested in. Again, it's an American uh, news site, and it says what they think is the, uh, the, you know, some of the reasons for Russia doing what it is doing. So have a listen to this. There are several reasons why Vladimir Putin decided to enter the Syrian war. President Putin's action was a shock to the world community. He had been supporting for years President Assad, but almost it appeared overnight, Russia took several actions, sending in a very large amount of military equipment to Syria, air attacks on ISIL, and then finally sending cruise missiles into Syria. This is a deft and very bold move by President Putin to show that he is a player, that he and his country have to be reckoned with. Potentially, they could turn the tide. After all, President Assad's troops were in trouble, and President Putin perceived that it was time to get in there and make sure that Assad did not fall. Another reason that President Putin wanted to enter the fray in Syria was to take attention off what was happening in Ukraine. His country, and he, getting a lot of criticism and also also a lot of sanctions coming his way and possibly by looking as if he was solving a problem in the world perhaps Europe 
and the United States would not want to impose sanctions coming up again in December. Finally, another reason is President Putin has a visceral hatred for any type of weakening of authority in a government. And so to the end, he has been supporting President Assad simply because he is the leader of Syria. President Putin does not want the regimes, even if they're repressive, to fall because he feels that chaos will come after that. The other thing that I wanted to show you is something equally as interesting, I think, that's also happening and it's still happening as we speak. In fact, it was on the news today. And that is Russia's economic collapse. It's sort of a bit strange, isn't it, that Russia is piling into the Middle East and it's spending enormous amounts on weaponry, <coughs> when actually it's in absolutely dire straits from a financial point of view. And the reason it's in a financial mess is because of the sudden and dramatic collapse in gas and oil price. Now, I was looking back, when I was here last year, January, I was saying exactly the same you might recall, I was saying actually there's been a massive collapse in oil price. It's, come, it's gone from $125 a set <laughs> down to $60 a barrel. It's unbelievable. It's come down that much in 12 months. And it's really impacted <coughs> Russia because Russia needs $100 a barrel to survive and to pay the bills. What, what was the price today? Anybody know? 34 percent over 36. Yeah, it's around 34. It obviously fluctuates a little bit, but 34, 35 dollars a barrel. So it's about half what it was last January. He couldn't afford what he was doing at 60 dollars a barrel, and now it's gone down again. It's gone up a, a, a few dollars uh, today because of the Saudi Iranian uh, situation that's also suddenly kicked off only over the last few days. We'll talk about that in just a second. Now, here's an astounding thing. I go and look in Elpis Israel. I go and read about what John Thomas said in 1849 in his book about the hope of Israel. This is what he wrote. I mean, I find this absolutely mind-blowing that he worked, worked it out, but he did. Where did the barbarians procure funds for the overthrow of the Western Empire in the 5th and 6th uh, centuries? Did they not support themselves by the spoil? Let the Russian treasury be as empty as it is said to be, and its expenditure exceed its revenue by double the alleged deficit. It will only operate as a pressure from within, causing her autocrat, the Russian ruler, to enter into the countries and to overflow and to pass over and to enrich himself with the spoil of those he is destined to subdue. He's basically saying in very nice language there, you know, let Russia be bankrupt because it's going to operate as a great big pressure from within to push them into something that they wouldn't have done otherwise. And of course, just flicking back to his Eagle 38, because I was, I was thinking, well, how did... John Thomas worked that out because it doesn't say anywhere that Russia's going to be bankrupt. But he worked it out by looking at Ezekiel 38, and this is what, this is what I think he did, um, and he looked in verse 12 of Ezekiel 38 where it says um, that, Russia's, uh, that Gog, uh, the Russian leader, has an evil thought, and in verse 12 it tells you what the evil thought is, is to take a spoil and to take a prey and to turn your hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, that's Israel, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have got cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. The motivation for the invasion of the Middle East and Israel in particular is goods and spoil. It is not a religious war. This I'm not saying there aren't some religious elements potentially to this, but the major driver for the invasion of Russia, of Israel, is not um, you know, a, a religious thing. It's clearly being told here, it's to go and get some cash. It's to fill your boots with uh, something. And isn't it astounding, we mentioned this last year, that Israel, over the last... Uh, few years, has found enormous, enormous gas fields. Some of the largest finds in recent decades is right there smack in Israel's territory. 
They've been in the land 60 odd years and only now have they found this huge wealth of, of gas. And of course, Putin loves gas. <coughs> <coughs> so I thought that's interesting. So let me play you some uh, headlines now around this uh, thing that we're talking about, which is the economic mess that Russia is in. So, uh, no music here. So this is Associated Press. So Kremlin pursues military modernization despite economic woes. Oil and gas crunch pushes Russia close to fiscal crisis. Russia tries to halt ruble slide as economic crisis returns to haunt Vladimir Putin. Russia key reserve fund to run dry by the end of next year. Russia plans $40 a barrel of oil for the next seven years as Saudi showdown intensifies. Saudi Arabia is killing the Russian economy in its fight to control oil prices. Um, now that is quite interesting, isn't it? Saudi Arabia is killing the Russian economy in its fight to control <coughs> oil prices. Did you see the slide before that? There's a war going on between the Kremlin and Saudi Arabia. This is massive. This is a great big news story. And the reason it's really interesting is simply this. What Saudi Arabia is doing as one of the very largest suppliers of oil in the, in the world is keeping production at massively high levels. And what that's doing is causing uh, huge overproduction. And uh, because demand is currently a bit weak and no production is high, it's pushing the price of oil down and down and down. What that's doing is crippling Russia. So there's a direct impact on what Saudi Arabia is doing, and it's directly hurting Russia. Look at this. This was December the 28th. So while we're sort of recovering after Christmas, maybe, there's a headline for you. Russia says Saudi Arabia has destabilized the oil market. Now, why, I ask you, is Saudi Arabia very, very significant from a Bible prophecy point of view? Anybody want to tell me? Because I've said quite a few words so far. I'm going to have a drink. Why, where, where does Saudi Arabia come in? Sheba and Eden. Sheba and Eden. It's in the next verse, look, that we were just looking at. There we are. Verse 13 of Ezekiel 38, Sheba and Eden and the merchants of Tarshish. And I guess I've read that a million times. But... And, and we talk a lot about Tarshish being Britain, which it is, and the young lions of Tarshish being America and uh, offshoots of the UK. And I'd sort of always known that Sheba and Eden is Saudi Arabia. But isn't it now highly significant that the first of the, the opposing nations on the list, because these are nations that are opposing Russia and Iran. These are nations, Sheba, Deedon, and the merchants of Tarshish, and all the young lions, say to the Russian leader, what are you doing? Have you come to take a spoil? Have you gathered your company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold? What are you doing? And how remarkable that the first nation on the list is Saudi Arabia. And how remarkable that right now, Russia is saying Saudi Arabia is a real pain in our neck, to put it, you know, in our language. They're causing us a lot of grief because of the, what they're doing with oil. And it's hurting us, and we don't really like it. Oh, there's bravado at the minute. So Russia says, oh, we can cope with $40 a barrel for the next eight years. It's complete hogwash. It's total hogwash. They can't cope. They're under severe stress at this time. And here's uh, the building and growing pressure. And what a remarkable man John Thomas was, I think, to have looked at that and said, well, for a nation to come and take a spoil, to be motivated by taking goods, probably means that they're in a financial mess. Because that's, did you see how he worked that out? That's incredible. And he wrote it. And now it's happening in front of our very eyes. Um, right, so there's another aspect to all of this, of course, and that is this. 
Russia is Bible prophecy's king of the north. And this is in Daniel chapter 11. So come and have a look at uh, uh, another prophecy then. So this is parallel uh, to Ezekiel 38. Very often, as we know in the Bible, we're not just told something once. We told it several times, and you put the jigsaw pieces together, and you make the picture. So, here we are, look, in verse uh, 40, we read about the king of the north, and you notice when this is all happening. Not 150 years ago, and not 100 years ago, and not 50 years ago, and not 10 years ago. It's happening in verse 40, at the time of the end. At the time of the end, the king of the south pushes at him, and we're going to have a look at who the him is in a minute, and the king of the north, there it is, look, shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, with many ships, he will enter into the countries and overflow and pass over, he will enter into the glorious land, and that's talking about Israel, and many countries will be overthrown, uh, we'll skip a few verses, um, uh, he will stretch forth his hand upon the countries the land of Egypt will not escape and he will have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and Ethiopians will be at his steps this is exactly what Ezekiel 38 said the only difference is it doesn't say Gog of the land of Mago chief prince of Meshach and Tubal it simply says what? the king of the north yes that's the equivalent phrase, the king of the... Now, is Russia north of Israel? Is it a good description? It's a brilliant description. It is king of the north. Do you know something? What's even more remarkable? I keep saying that, but it, I'm just bowled over by everything happening. This prophecy of Daniel chapter 11 was actually, before the time of the end in verse 40, there are 30 odd other verses, aren't there? Do you, do you know something? This whole chapter, before the time of the end bit, was about two warring and opposing forces. And one in the north were the Seleucids, based in Syria. And in the south, it was the Ptolemies, based in Egypt. And the whole chapter is about a war, an ongoing war over many, many decades, in fact, <coughs> going on for nearly 200 years, between two warring uh, parties. Syria versus Egypt. And isn't it amazing that Russia now has entered into the very territory of the ancient king of the north, the Seleucid homeland of Syria. Isn't that amazing? Now, we know the king of the north is Russia because we're told that in Ezekiel 38. I tell you now, if we didn't have Ezekiel 38, we'd have to guess it was Russia. We might even have said it was Syria. But because of Ezekiel 38 and the naming of the places, we know categorically it is Russia. And you might say, well, why isn't it Syria? If the ancient one was Syria, why is it switched to Russia? Why do you think that is then? Why is it not Syria at the time of the end? Why does it remove from Syria? Why? It's been foretold. It's been foretold, but what... what, Russia what? takes over. Russia takes over, but what have we said about Syria? Destroyed. It's destroyed. It can't be the latter day king of the north because it ceases to exist. That's why Russia comes in and takes over the mantle of the king of the north and sits in the very territory ultimately um, of, of, of Syria as it's starting to do right now. Now the king of the south of course is no longer Egypt because Egypt is another prophecy that we're not looking at because Egypt has got into a right basket case of a mess. It can't operate as the ancient king of the south or the modern king of the south. The new king of the south is who? Who's the opposing force that we've talked about? Sheba and Dedan. With with the UK and America as, the, as Tarshish and the Young Lions. So, there we are. So what we've now got here in verse 40 is the king of the south, which is, we know Sheba and Dedan, which we know is Saudi Arabia, which we know is America and, um, and uh, UK. Thank you. Uh, and they push at somebody. And when this push has happened, the king of the north comes against him like a whirlwind. And so 
There's some very significant event, wouldn't you say, here? Yeah. And I don't actually think it's happened yet. No. The significant event is the king of the south pushes at somebody called him, and at that point then, the king of the north appears. Now the question is, who is the him that the king of the south pushes at? And the answer to that, of course, is whoever the him is of the previous four verses. And you'll notice in verse 30, in, at the end of verse 35, it talks about a time yet appointed. So there's a gap in the, ancient, in the prophecy, you see, between verse 35 and verse 36. Verse 36 <laughs> is the very man that the king of the south is going to push against. And it is a man, by the way. It isn't just a country. Do you know how I know that? Because if you go through the whole of Daniel 11, it talks about a king does this and a king does that and he does this and he does that. And every single solitary one of those times is an identifiable human being. So when it says here the king shall do according to his will, it is a man. A real living human being man. Not just a great nation. He's obviously a king of a nation, which is important, but he's an identifiable human being. And look what this man does. He exalts himself and magnifies himself against every god. And he speaks marvellous things against the god of gods and prospers until the indignation is accomplished and that that is determined that is done. And he won't regard the god of his fathers or the desire of women. And he doesn't regard any god, for he magnifies himself above all. But in his estate, he will honour the god of forces, of armies, of military things. And a God whom his father knew not, he will honour with gold and silver and precious stones. Oh, this man is, likes military things and he likes money. He likes cash. He likes spoil. He likes wealth. And he works in, uh, you, you notice in verse 39, uh, thus shall he do in the most strongholds. Interesting word, that's the word fortress. Amazingly, the word Kremlin is a uh, means stronghold. It's exactly what it means, a fortress. And he, he works with a strange God whom he will acknowledge and increase with glory. And he will cause them to rule over many and will divide the land for a gain. Now there's a lot of info in here. But here's the interesting bit. Verse 36 suddenly introduces us to a man out of the blue who must exist, must he not, at the time of the end. Because at verse 40 it says, at the time of the end, the king of the south pushes at this particular man. So the man must exist at the time the king of the south pushes at him, would you not say? Yeah. And what we then are saying is, well this king suddenly appears from nowhere, and obviously exists at the time of the end. Who was the previous king that was spoken about in the previous verses of Daniel 11? And do you know who it was? It was a man called Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the last ruler of the Seleucid Empire, which was the northern king of the north. And so Antiochus Epiphanes came to, uh, came to an end, and then the prophecy stops. And then suddenly we're told at a time yet appointed a certain king is going to appear who magnifies himself, who honours the god of forces, who loves cash, who does all sorts of other things that we haven't got time to look at. And the king of the south, American, Britain and Saudi Arabia, start pushing at him. And when that happens, the king of the north then reacts by saying, I'm coming against you. Who's he coming against? He's coming against the king of the south. And he enters into the glorious land. And so on. Now let me just show you something very interesting here. The king of the north in Daniel chapter 11 and the a man that he's spoken about in Daniel chapter 8 are identical people. Daniel chapter 8 is all about a particular man, and guess what his name is? Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the ancient ruler of the Seleucids. <coughs> but we're told that a latter-day Antiochus would appear at the very end of time. And we're told in Daniel 28 that through the king's policy, he will cause craft, which means deceit, to prosper in his hand, and he will magnify himself in his heart. This latter-day Antiochus Epiphanes, sorry, 
uh, yeah, this Latter-day Antiochus Epiphanes is going to be somebody who magnifies himself in his heart. What we're told in Daniel 11, verse 36, is that the king who exists, this latter-day Antiochus Epiphanes as well, will do according to his will, and he will exalt himself and magnify himself. And if you want to spend a, a few minutes going through Daniel 8 and comparing it to this king, you'll find that there is uh, word after word after word after word that line up beautifully. I'm going to show you a picture of Antiochus Epiphanes. That's Antiochus Epiphanes. And doesn't he look remarkably like a current ruler on the planet? <laughs> you see, the thing is, the King of the North has got a Russian ruler at the minute who works in the strongholds that, uh, that basically <laughs> honours the God of Forces and actually loves cash and wants a spoil. We could well be looking at the man, and isn't it interesting that actually Putin is doing what he's doing? How long is he going to be in power for? How long has he got left? <coughs> when's his, when's his, I mean, obviously, he could keep going. He's, he's an autocrat. He could keep going if he wanted to. When, when's his final year? Six years. 2024. He could be in power. That's basically as long as he could be in power unless he changes the constitution. Let's have a look then and see what's happening between the king of the north and the king of the south. Have we got an aggravation between the two? Is there a push building up? Let's have a quick look at this. So, oh, oh, there we go. America puts a 10 tank buster jets on Russia's doorstep. Reuters, Russia and US spar over global crisis at UN meeting, February the 23rd. Associated Press, American Russian war games rekindle Cold War tensions, April the 9th. Russia's biggest threat to American national Russia is biggest threat to American national security. That was July the 9th. America warns Russia over military support for Assad, September the 5th. <coughs> Syria conflict, America presses Russia on military buildup, September the 16th. Russia threatens America with nuclear arms countermeasure, September the 23rd. How Putin blindsided the US over Syria, September the 30th. Syria conflict, Russia warns America of proxy war risk, October the 31st. Here's how World War III could start tomorrow. That was in the Daily Telegraph on November the 24th, talking about all the things that we're talking about. Pretty amazing. I just want to show you something. Um, how are we doing for... Are you, have you had enough now? Because I'm just conscious now of um, blowing my time, haven't I? Are you all right for a minute? Because I've got a little bit more. Have you got another ten minutes, or are you sure? Yeah. We can call it a day whenever you like. Sure. Are you okay just for a minute? <laughs> this bit's quite amazing. So, in... The prophecy of Joel. Let's find Joel quickly. So this is Joel <laughs> chapter 1. <coughs> now Joel is a pain to find, especially when you're on the platform and you haven't marked it. <laughs> right, so. <coughs> Once you've found Joel, I'm going to play you a little video. Then we're just going to have a quick look at Joel. So... Right, here we go. Have a look at this. This happened in July this year. <coughs> Not for 30 years, say officials, has Russia suffered a plague like this. Vast areas of the country's agricultural south are seeing swarms of locusts devour entire fields. Officials say at least 10% of crops have already been destroyed. It's devastating the livelihoods of local farmers, like Pyotr Stepanchenko. Look, he says, there's nothing left on the corn. The locusts ate it all, from the leaves to the cobs. Officials from the Russian Ministry of Agriculture say they're stepping up efforts to save the harvest, declaring a state of emergency and spraying the crops with powerful pesticides. But officials admit the locust swarm is moving too fast across southern Russia. 
и они... Калмыкия, Астрахан, Волгоград, Дагестан. There is no more food left for locusts there, so they have flown to a new source of food. They have wingspans of nearly 12 centimeters, like small sparrows. Some frustrated locals have posted videos of themselves trying to hold back the tide. But it all seems futile in the face of such an overwhelming Russian swarm. Matthew Chance, CNN Moscow. I don't know whether you saw that, but that's interesting. Because I tell you what, it's interesting. In Joel chapter 1, um, what we read about is, in verse 4, uh, it's all about locusts. Now, you might not notice it's about locusts, uh, because in the AV, it talks about palmer worms and locusts, and locusts and something called a canker worm and caterpillars. But actually, if you've got a modern version, it won't use the words caterpillars and canker worms and palmer worms. It uses the word locust, and it uses different words for the development of the stages of a locust, right? So... What verse 4 is talking about is the development of a locust from its uh, solitary phase into what is known as its gregarious phase when it changes from something that looks very much just like a grasshopper into something that is voracious and gregarious and, and plows through and eats loads of stuff. Now you might say, well, what, what, what's this got to do with anything? But if you look in verse 6, it actually says that... Uh, in verse 6, for a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion and has the cheek teeth of a great lion. So, effectively, there's a nation that's ultra strong, <coughs> even as strong as a lion, that comes down upon uh, Israel, because it says it's upon my land, and they're like locusts. And we can see, when we look at this, that in fact, this is talking about Russia, because this nation comes to an end in Joel chapter 2 verse 20 and it tells us where it's from. This great army that's like locusts, there's so many of them, actually are from where? They're a northern army. It's the king of the north. It's exactly the same thing. So basically, there's four stages to, to, to the locusts development. And God says that they're actually very much like this great army uh, that comes down. And when the locusts come, uh, they are like, an, it's going to be as if it's a, a nation that's invaded my land. And there's going to be so many of these people um, that they're powerful without number. Now, let me show you this, right? This is... So here is a locust. <coughs> And I just put this picture in of a locust to have a look at what a locust looks like. And then suddenly, the more I looked at this locust, the more I suddenly realised that the way God has designed this creature, the undercarriage of the locust has been designed to look like what? Good. It's been, see, see this guy here, this is, the, this is the locust, but you see he's got, so, let me put this up, right? So there is an ancient soldier with his helmet and his breastplate and all the rest of it. There you can see is this guy's little helmet. You can even, it almost looks like he's got a little nose. And all of this looks like armor plating down here. God has designed the undercarriage of a locust to look like a human being dressed for battle. Now that is pretty amazing, isn't it? Because God says they're like an army, and he's gone and designed the locust to look like a human being dressed in armor. Even a modern day uh, person has still got the helmet and got the body armor, and looks like he's holding a gun and all the rest of it. There's a brilliant little video, uh, and this video shows you, how, it was on the BBC six months ago, it shows you how the locust becomes from a green little grasshopper into this aggressive, metamorphosized, uh, voracious creature. These two locusts are the Jekyll and Hyde of the insect world. Through a special transformation, one can turn into the other. The physical change involved in this transformation is insignificant compared to the other metamorphoses we have seen. 
Yet the change in their way of life is dramatic. The green locust live a solitary and inconspicuous existence. But transformed into the other locust, it becomes a destructive pest. Flying in vast swarms that wreak devastation on crops. The change is not one of shape, but in behavior. Professor Malcolm Burroughs is a neurobiologist who's studying how this happens. I would call that a grasshopper. Is that incorrect? No, that's absolutely correct. There's, there's something like 4,000 species of grasshopper in the world, and only about 13 of them can show this remarkable change from one state, this state, yes. to this state, the gregarious phase, that forms swarms. That turns into that. That turns into that. Blimey. The difference between the two is shown by an elegant experiment. First, introduce a green locust into an arena, which has empty space on one side and a crowd of locusts on the other. For a green locust, seeing a crowd of other locusts repels it. It wants to be alone. It heads for a quiet corner. But when a darker colored locust is introduced, it's a very different story. This is a gregarious insect. It heads straight for the crowd. And it is this behavior that creates swarms. But what triggers the individual locust to switch from one behavior to the other? And basically, what happens is they think because they keep rubbing each other, they keep knocking against each other and pushing against each other, at some point they go through like almost like an incredible halt type of uh, uh, change. And you. This little green thing that was on its own is now completely transformed into some horrible, uh, devastating uh, insect, and they swarm together. And it's the pushing and the shoving and the rubbing that they think suddenly has a, this chemical reaction that changes it as almost like a, a caterpillar into a butterfly transformation. It's quite amazing to see. But locusts are highly, highly, highly destructive, as we know, because in chapter two, when this army comes down, and bearing in mind that they're like locusts, it says in verse 2 of Joel 2, that there's a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, and as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there has not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So this army is like nothing you've seen before, says God. This is an enormous army. And in verse 3, it says, A fire devours before them, and a flame burns behind them. The land in front of them is like the Garden of Eden, and the land behind them is a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes. And they look like the horse, horses and horsemen uh, as, they, as they run, and like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, will they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble as a strong people set in battle array, and so it goes on. So if you think about it, imagine that these are the locusts coming, and in front there's a Garden of Eden, and behind it's a wilderness, and because it's been destroyed. But these locusts aren't locusts, it's this. That is what he saw. And that is how he's describing it. And in fact, of course, as we've just read, in verse 5... Like the noise of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountain. So, you can see it. I don't even know if he had a vision of what it was actually going to look like in the future, and that's how he could record it. 
but whatever he saw, whatever Joel saw, you can see if you convert locusts into people, what a terrifying, terrifying sight this is. And as we've already said, Putin has got uh, nearly two million uh, soldiers that he can direct and move down into the Middle East. It's a shocking thing, but it all proceeds... Uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and down they will come a great big force and by the way that square there is the size of many many locust plagues 480 square miles is a, is a locust plague that, that would come down and when you look in Joel 2 it talks of a day of darkness and gloominess a day of clouds and thick darkness we've just read this God says, I'll remove far off from you the northern army. In Ezekiel 38, verse 9, it's got exactly the same word. So darkness and gloominess, it's like a storm in, in Ezekiel 38. It's a day of clouds in Joel 2. Uh, you'll be like a cloud, says Ezekiel 38, verse 9. You'll be spread upon the mountains, says uh, Joel 2. You're going to cover the land, says Ezekiel 38. A great people and a strong, says Joel 2. All your bands and many people with you, says uh, Ezekiel chapter 38. It's a northern army, says Joel. You're coming from the far north, says Ezekiel 38. That's talking about Russia. That is talking about Russia. If you decode the whole lot, that's what we're looking at. So, really, um, we've spent uh, a fair bit of time looking at Russia, far more than I wanted to, and there's much more that we could be saying. So, we, the, the other part to all of this, of course, is what's been happening with uh, Iran. So, I don't know when you want me to stop, because I've now pr pr pretty much realised that I've completely blown it. So, uh, <laughs> should we, should we, do you want to call it a day and we can do a part two at some point? Might be an idea, mightn't it? But I think what we've proved probably without us dealing with the whole thing is, and just by looking at Russia itself, <coughs> that we are really very much at the brink of, uh, at the end of all things, don't you think? And the situation with Saudi Arabia and Iran is another story. That's in Isaiah 21. Go and look at it. It's everything that is happening be between Saudi and Iran is happening in Isaiah 21. All of these things are happening. You know, what does it mean to us? It surely means to us that more than ever, we need to be on our toes. We need to be switching uh, off the, you know, whatever it is that we might be watching and saying, let's make sure that we are absolutely a wide awake because literally the Lord Jesus Christ could come at any point because when you put all the passages together, it seems clear to me that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ actually happens before the Russian invasion into Israel. I'm absolutely sure of that, which means God's given us all the warning, and when Jesus comes back, I don't think we could stand before him and say, do you know what, if only you'd shown me a bit more, if only you'd made it clearer that you were about to come, I could have done something about it. He'll say, well, what about all of this? Surely you couldn't have missed all, oh yes, while well, I was watching uh, EastEnders, I didn't see all of that. You know, the world is busy watching everything else. God has given us all of this so that we can be ready for when Jesus comes and the kingdom is established. I do apologise for going on quite as long as I have.